establishing universal jurisdiction. Jose Miguel Vivanco uh, is the director of the America's Division of Human Rights Watch. Human Rights Watch. Human Rights Watch is a, a human rights organization with presence around the world and highly active in the places where they are, particularly in Latin America, which is the case that occupies us today. Before Human Rights Watch, he worked as an attorney for the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights at uh, the uh, Organization of American States. In 1990, he founded the Center for Justice and International Law, an NGO that brings claims before uh, human uh, rights international bodies. He has also uh, been a lecturer in the uh, Law Center of the Georgetown University and in the Inter Advanced International Studies School for the John Hopkins University. He is uh, uh, Chilean by origin and one of the most uh, noticeable leaders in his area in the defense of human rights. Jose Miguel, the mic is yours. Well, thank you then. It is an honor for me and certainly a pleasure to be here with you today, particularly seeing so many familiar faces, colleagues, friends, and uh, Baltazar Garzón himself, a prominent a legal and a political figure uh, to whom many of us owe a great debt, particularly in Latin America. And I say we have a great debt with Judge Garzón because uh, he had, at the right time, the genius, the courage, and the strength to attempt what was at the time nearly a legal experiment. I'm talking about invoking the principles of universal uh, jurisdiction to bring, to bring one of the worst dictators ever to set foot in Latin America to justice. I'm talking about Augusto Pinochet for hundreds of disappearances, crimes against humanity, executions, and torture. Legal provisions were actually in books and legal texts not only in Spain, but in so many other countries in Europe and other regions. However, it uh, took his effort to uh, bring them to life, to enact that letter of the law to make justice for historical victims the traditional losers in uh, legal claims when serious and systematic crimes were committed against fundamental rights, as did happen in Latin America. Balthazar Garzón invoked universal jurisdiction when very few believed in that notion. And uh, Certainly, at the time, it looked like uh, a dreamer's task, a dreamer's endeavor. I believe, however, and I don't believe I am exaggerating, that he actually changed the history of Latin America, particularly Chile. Chile, uh, has or started going through a democratic transition starting in uh, the decade of the 90s after 17 years of military dictatorship. A transition perceived by the political class of Chile as 
depending as resting on the uh, capability of Chileans to coexist in peace without ever challenging, challenging uh, the authority of the military forces and particularly of their dictator. Remember that the first democratic election after 17 years of dictatorship was held in the 90s, in which Pinochet remained as the chief commander of the armed forces precisely until 1998. From 90 to 98, Pinochet continued to uh, hold uh, an office as a chief commander of the army. After 1998, when his office was due, he was automatically, uh, or he automatically turned into a uh, senator for life, obviously in agreement with a law drafted by himself, and uh, while forecasting his, even his possible, uh, uh, his possibility of losing the um, uh, fake election he had organized, and uh, in events organized by President Elwin and then by President Frey, certain initiatives were uh, launched to rebuild the past to determine the magnitude of aggressions against human rights committed during Pinochet's uh, regime. But these uh, uh, crimes were limited only to uh, disappearances and executions, not torture, which was systematically practiced by the system. The um, testimonial of the Commission for Truth was tremendously relevant and it deeply shook, uh, shook uh, Chilean society. Unfortunately, it did not lead to any legal actions leading to a claim for justice for the hundreds of thousands of cases of individuals executed and tortured during the regime. At any rate, this process uh, did help um, uh, claim the memory of thousands of Pinochet victims. Unfortunately, it did not lead to any legal uh, a penalties, except for uh, the uh, isolated efforts of certain judges that ordered investigations to be opened uh, about the abuses committed, not only during the dictatorship, but also after or during the ensuing uh, democracy. As a matter of fact, um, President Gerwin coined a phrase that pretty much sums up that time, justice when possible, meaning that there were limits to a legal investigation. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, the most serious limitation was set by the Amnesty Act of 1978, which prevented investigations on serious breaches to human rights committed between 1973, the year of the military coup d'etat, and 1978, which is precisely when the worst violations to human rights were committed in Chile. And that was perhaps the tallest hurdle for the demands for justice or the claims for justice by international bodies and by the families of uh, victims uh, trying to resort to justice. It was very difficult in those circumstances to launch an investigation. As a matter of fact, some uh, members of the parliament introduced uh, bills of law to uh, overrule this amnesty decree to no avail. Others introduced uh, different projects for the interpretation of the amnesty decree, which was, like I said, a tall hurdle against justice, and all of them failed. President Irwin himself did attempt to promote the Elwin Doctrine of the time, meaning that courts of law were supposed to investigate facts and establish accountability to then finally apply amnesty in the case of serious crimes covered by the amnesty, but not 
It, it did not include the possibility for courts of law to directly investigate these crimes. But even this attempt was a failure. And after many years, when Pinochet was on the verge of uh, uh, finishing his term as a chief commander, interesting precedents took place in the Supreme Court of Chile. However, things remained the same in the sense that the amnesty decree prevented any possible investigation on crimes against human rights. And Pinochet was uh, counting on parliamentary immunity. So for an eventual uh, legal suit, uh, a, a, a foreign a venue would have to be considered so, something unthinkable in Chile at the time. Regardless or against all odds, some families filed claims uh, when uh, Pinochet was uh, uh, chief commander of the army around 1996 and claims were filed uh, both in Chile and Argentina as well as in Spain, invoking precisely the principle of universal jurisdiction. Spanish justice, the Spanish Congress, partly opened and considered those uh, claims in the understanding that some Spanish nationals had been victims of violations against human rights in both Argentina and Chile. Well, at least an investigation was opened, was launched in Spain. Very few uh, were opened in Chile. <coughs> and that was the context in which General Pinochet decided to travel to London in 1998 to hold meetings with Margaret Thatcher, among others, political meetings, friendship meetings. He decided to do some shopping. And I would say it's his, his planned trip was very revealing of the Chilean context at the time, a context in which Pinochet became untouchable above the law and he had reason to believe himself invincible above the law as i said in chile those who supported the democratic governments of the time felt uh, no inclination from bringing pinochet to justice there was uh, some sort of uh, political realism, this uh, real politique that was uh, the thing among political classes, obviously not among victims and their families, and not among a few political uh, sectors that kept to claim for justice in the case of abuses committed by uh, Pinochet. But I would say Pinochet succeeded in becoming an institutional figure, something that was taken for granted. Uh, considering the uh, inability for anyone to review what had happened in the past, or even questioning his behavior without questioning the integrity of democracy a highly valued notion for many politicians in Chile. <clears throat> in 1998, however, Pinochet was arrested in London following a warrant issued by Judge Baltazar Garzon, <clears throat> who had invoked the principle of universal jurisdiction stating or, or requesting uh, the um, authorities of the United Kingdom to arrest Pinochet on accounts of genocide, terrorism, torture, disappearances, human rights violations, and the like. 
Uh, British uh, law enforcement agencies complied with the warrant, arrested Pinochet, and after that, a whole set of legal decisions were made that made history in international law in the field of human rights. Two particular court decisions by uh, uh, courts of law defining the terms of justice, even in the case of uh, individuals that might be protected by immunity. At that time, Pinochet tried to evade his responsibilities by invoking a special immunity as, an, as a former head of state and claiming that anything that might have happened during those years in Chile was but the result of actions that took place while he was a head of state. And at any rate, uh, an official in office. Fortunately, his argument was declined by Lord Judges by a majority, an important majority, and uh, the ruling was that torture and executions cannot be seen as official actions uh, covered by the umbrella of immunity. The uh, immunity argument presented by uh, Pinochet was dismissed. And then the ruling was voided on a technicality that arised on uh, uh, Judge Hoffman's uh, recusation who convinced uh, the Lord Judges that this ruling had to be voided. And then a second ruling was issued ratifying uh, the same legal values and legal concepts and establishing that uh, Pinochet could actually be extradited following the United Nations Convention Against Torture, which, in the opinion of the Lord Judges, clearly established the principle of extradition or penalty. The option of returning Pinochet to Chile was considered as unfeasible, as his return to his country would involve for his crimes to uh, remain unpunished. In other words, Pinochet returning to Chile would have meant uh, uh, or would have involved uh, the application of the Amnesty Act as had been uh, happening during the past few years and he could invoke his capacity as a, a, a senator for life. The government of Chile decided to defend General Pinochet based on the principle of national sover sovereignty, stating that domestic courts were the ones entitled to a judge a Chilean citizen for crimes committed in Chile rather than British or Spanish courts, particularly when most victims were Chileans themselves, in an obvious contradiction with the fundamental principles of universal jurisdiction. Lord Judges established that since the Convention Against Torture in the United Nations had been ratified, by the United Kingdom in 1988, and since it was still valid for Chile and for Spain, the extradition of General Pinochet was uh, uh, not only uh, feasible but acceptable on the account of torture committed in Chile from 1988 on. In other words, during the last years of his dictatorship. Judge Gerzon succeeded in achieving this. In the terms that the Lord Judges gave Judge Gerzon, it did not seem feasible. And uh, within the context of identifying charges of torture, genocide was dismissed as the Spanish legislation 
uh, encompasses a persecution or uh, extermination for political reasons as a part of uh, political crimes. And, and the British legislation, the definition of genocide, that category was not included. So, in virtue of certain reciprocity principles regulating extradition standards, the, the uh, charge of um, genocide was dismissed. However, Judge Garzon gathered a, f a file of several cases of torture uh, that could be attributed to Pinochet, along with cases of enforced disappearances in, uh, or using the argument that hiding the whereabouts of individuals had uh, the purpose of psychologically torturing the victims thereof. The British Lord Judges uh, read all the files submitted by the Spanish uh, legal authorities. As a matter of fact, the judge that was to rule on the requested extradition ruled in favor of extradition. Moreover, he explicitly authorized the prosecutors, or he authorized Spanish prosecutors to investigate and dig up information about enforced disappearances that might be considered as psychological torture. That was part of the authorization granted by the UK Lord Judges for the extradition of General Pinochet. As we know, the Chilean government and Pinochet's defense put a lot of pressure on countries for Pinochet to be uh, released based on medical consideration. They tried to certify that he was in no condition to exercise his rights for, on accounts of uh, mental health. Medical studies uh, conducted in London were not conclusive. However, uh, Jack Straw, the Minister, Minister of Internal Affairs, in a specifically political decision, not a legal one, ordered Pinochet's return to Chile. After this moment, or having said this, I don't believe I exaggerate if I point out that two different transitions took place in Chile. One after the end of the military dictatorship in 1990, where the free election where President Elwin was elected, and then President Frey, and later on President Lagos. And then a different transition after Pinochet's arrest in London. <coughs> Pinochet's arrest in London reopened not only the discussion on justice and truth in Chile, a discussion that was practically frozen about the truth uh, after the truth report, a report invoking principles of political stability to prevent uh, military officials from being questions, questioned except in the case of Orlando Letelier's murder in Washington, which had been specifically excluded of the Amnesty Act in 1978. Other claims on human rights violations were dismissed or obliterated, particularly those against Pinochet. I believe, however, that the impact of the exercise of universal jurisdiction and the information that was revealed uh, or disclosed uh, to uh, British judges made it impossible to <coughs> uh, portray UK judges as communists were, had, that were highly motivated to uh, trample on the prestige of uh, military institutions in Chile. I would say that the fact 
that these UK judges uh, read the detailed files of what happened during Pinochet's uh, regime. And the fact that they decided that he had to be held accountable for those uh, actions and that he could be extradited to Spain, the fact that there was enough prima facie uh, evidence to authorize his uh, extradition, all of those facts together uh, were part of this historical decision. When uh, Pinochet uh, went back to Santiago after 17 months arrest in London, he came into a different country. Chile had changed. The feeling that nobody, not even General Pinochet, could be placed above the law. The feeling that he had to be made accountable for the atrocities committing during those years. The idea that he was not untouchable. The notion that he could be uh, investigated and tried somehow supported the argument or uh, uh, somehow uh, made uh, invalid the claim of uh, the Chilean government that there were guarantees in Chile for the people, that there was no obstacle for Pinochet to uh, stand trial in Chile. This argument was seen as invalid. And it seemed clear that uh, uh, reading the files on, on claims against Pinochet during all those years was made possible. I would say that if the status quo in Chile had not been changed by the direct intervention of the universal jurisdiction principle, it never would have been uh, it never would have been possible to uh, prevent Pinochet from going back to Chile. Uh, I would say the most important instance of this is the caravan of death, or the parade of death, based on the murder and disappearance of dozens of people in the north of Chile between September and October 1973. During a military mission headed by General Ariana Stark, who, according to legal investigations, could not act without the direct authorization of uh, General Pinochet. And he was investigated for that, not only uh, for uh, this account, but for many other violations against human rights. He was investigated for corruption, for illegal bank accounts. He had over 300 illegal bank accounts in the Riggs Bank in the United States under different acronyms of his name, with different ID pictures. And for some, he could uh, not at all justify. And all this led to his extradition. And I would believe I believe that I have to mention an important change in the case law of the Chilean Supreme Court. Up until uh, Pinochet's uh, trip to London, it was considered that disappearances were subject to the Amnesty Act. In other words, that he could not be investigated as there was uh, a law decree preventing investigation of violations uh, of human rights between 73 and 78. The case law of the Supreme Court um, underwent a change during the time Pinochet was in London, and the hypothesis of permanent abduction was adopted. In other words, investigation on enforced disappearances uh, could actually be uh, filed into court as they, these crimes involved permanent abduction. And if no news were had about the whereabouts of the person disappeared or if their body didn't turn up, investigations were to continue even 
uh, going to the extreme of uh, uh, applying penalty to those considered accountable for these crimes. During Pinochet's arrest in London, the dialogue board was created in Chile between military officials, active officials, and human rights defendants. And this put uh, the human rights issue back in the agenda as a central point for the discussion in the Chilean democratic transition. Military officials admitted accountability for the first time ever for human rights violations committed during those years. With, uh, not in open terms, not in open and clear terms, but they somehow admitted that military institutions were accountable for violations committed during those years. And uh, they promised the famous nevermore. And they also promised to deliver information on the disappeared. Well, I'm, at least they provided and they disclosed information about 34 or 35 cases. There are many other cases in which military institutions claim not to have any uh, further data. But perhaps the most important outcome of this uh, dialogue board was the fact that it laid the foundation for Pinochet uh, uh, being judged outside his country, and beyond that, the uh, implementation or uh, the participation of uh, high court just judges was justified in human rights cases. Judge Juan Guzman who played an important role in uh, uh, Pinochet's trials and uh, in the case of the death parade, was lucky enough to uh, devote his time particularly to that subject. And he had the support he needed to hold uh, the perpetrators accountable. Up until today, that institution remains uh, of a tremendous importance in the field of the defense of human rights, and there are at least 16 generals of the Chilean army in a jail for violations to human rights, and all the leaders of intelligence services or the different intelligence agencies that served uh, uh, Pinochet and aided and abetted in uh, those uh, crimes are uh, now um, doing time for the crimes. I would say that one thing we learn from the Chilean case also has implications on other countries. This never would have happened without uh, this idea. Fortunately, it uh, has brought an improvement in human rights defense standards and particularly in uh, making uh, the victims more visible, particularly those who keep claiming for justice. I would say that the uh, ruling of the Argentinian Supreme Court of declaring the uh, Obedience Act law as a null and void was a major step forward. And it reflects the exercise of a universal jurisdiction started up by Judge Garzon. Uh, during that decade. Other efforts uh, have been made in the region to prove that justice is possible, to prove that uh, high personality can be investigated when crimes against humanity are committed. 
They have come to prove that there are no borders, no havens, that such important legal concepts are under study, that all authorities, particularly legal authorities, particularly in places where there is an independent judicial power, have not only the right but also the duty particularly in cases of torture, the duty of investigating those files as an opportunity like the one I've been mentioning arises. Thank you very much. And thank you, Jose Miguel. Perhaps I would like to uh, here, uh, 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 for Lola to make a comment on what Jose Miguel would, has just said, and perhaps after that we could go into the Q&A session. So, Jose Miguel, congratulations on your wonderful presentation. Earlier today, we had this panel where we discuss the enforcement of universal jurisdiction as a tool that is necessary in order to prevent uh, impunity from happening. <coughs> and throughout your presentation, throughout your speech, we've come to realize that it has been a necessary tool, a tool which has been necessary <coughs> to promote uh, political and social change and for the political evolution and democratic evolution of a given landscape. Picture <coughs> what, how significant the enforcement of universal jurisdiction can be in those terms. And I quote, the country changed. It changed after the enforcement of universal jurisdiction by a justice overseer, uh, a just, uh, overseer. And I think that from that enforcement, the whole world changed. And we discussed this before, earlier today, how the world changed after the arrest warrant issued by Gaton against Pinochet. I think it changed the roles of stakeholders, of victims and perpetrators in international cooperation back in 1996. 1996 that's when we see different claims lodged at the criminal court in Spain because of the crimes committed by the Argentinian and Chilean dictatorships. And this changes everything, this upset the whole world. It was a change in the whole world in the face of the promotion of human rights. Ten years later, in 2006, we find the f first claims before the criminal court for the crimes <coughs> committed during Franco's dictatorship. Nothing different from what he had done before. And he did just the same. He waited for all the claims to come in. He conducted first checks and then he allowed them to be processed. And he wanted uh, to give an answer to those victims who were claiming for truth and justice. They were not asking for repair or remedy, they were just asking for justice. And the result was not a political change, it was not a social change, it was not a change uh, in, in the mindset or positioning of citizens or the political structures, but it was only prosecution, prosecution of the judge who intended to look into these facts, uh, that was the result. And I guess Leave it there, I just mention it. And I have a question for Valtasar having to do with what you said. Did you ever consider what the implications of your arrest warrant against Pinochet would be? Did you manage to picture what the future perspective would be and on what did you feel afterwards? Well, let's thank you, thank you. But let's take questions first. There are a few questions which I'll reply later. But before, I think it's time for Jesse Miguel to take questions. There's one regarding amnesty. To what extent amnesty or pardons 
or the law on amnesty may allow someone as Pinochet not to be properly convicted or sanctioned for their crimes against human rights in the extent of law. And there is another complementary question. To what extent Pinochet's prosecution has led to positive developments at a national <coughs> level in Chile's uh, justice compared to the independence of the judiciary powers and the executive power and uh, hands in Latin America. I, I, I hope I understood this correctly. Do you mean if, if amnesty can be shared, if whether it, we can uh, we can have an amnesty preventing prosecution from happening? Well, an approach like this in other times, other decades, <coughs> where they used to invoke uh, this idea of a political asyl asylum for governors or heads of estates or former heads of estates that would flee their own countries with a terrible history in the violation of human rights. And it was understood that it was beyond judiciary control, but uh, somehow they had some kind of protection via political asylum, which, by the way, is supposed to be granted for the protection of victims and not for the protection of <coughs> perpetrators of violations of human rights. Well, back then, uh, it might have seemed possible, but nowadays, because the development of case law and all the consensus uh, that's been achieved after the prosecution of uh, Pinochet and after the creation of the court and the Rome's institutes and some other trials that have been taken place and, and conducted by special tribunals and courts, apart from the consistent rulings of the Inter-American Courts avoiding amnesty laws passed in Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil, uh, Peru, El Salvador. Well, I guess this is a way where we see this is a case law of, of jurisprudence, of case law that proves how this is not possible, how in the promotion of human rights, perpetrators, no matter who they are, no matter whether they've had a, a public office, they cannot go unpunished. Just because of that, because they've had held a, a public office, they need to be punished, they need to be convicted and prosecuted before that. And I think it is only valid for political negotiations, uh, such as uh, is happening now in Colombia, those are peacekeeping negotiations where one of the specific offers by the government to the uh, FRQ guerrilla groups, not just guerrilla groups, but also military groups and paramilitary groups within the context of the legal framework for peace, which is an already approved constitutional amendment. And the idea is that the main perpetrators of the worst violations of human rights might not even spend one day in prison. Maybe they could use this voiding or annulment of the sentence regardless of the severity of the crimes. Luckily enough, the Colombian court did not approve the, the standard. And so in Colombia, it is understood that policymakers need to find some kind of formula to bring justice to victims, victims of the armed conflict, regardless of Sorry, especially when it is about serious violations of human rights and all, always considering perpetrators. As for the independence of the judiciary from the executive powers, well, I guess in order to, to word all those principles, we need to have the independence of the judiciary power. If we do not have a judiciary system that it is uh, independent enough in order to promote this uh, the enforcement, uh, 
because they could be part of a regulated legal system and there are different international treaties on human rights that, that are, are ratified and so whenever necessary the state will have to invoke them, will have to enforce those treatments and for that the judiciary needs to be solid, sound, robust and independent from the executive and hence uh, working outside political pressures and, and lobbying. Whenever we talk about Chile, <coughs> well, we see this alleged or suspected responsibility or accountability by Henry Kissinger. And so the question here is, if so, if his involvement has been proven, historically proven. How come Henry Kissinger has not been prosecuted? And what are the chances that he will be prosecuted? Well, <coughs> first of all, we would need to establish the degree of criminal accountability held by political jobs or, or, or offices, specifically in the US when it comes to violations of human rights uh, committed in, in, in Chile, Argentina, or other countries. There are informal studies conducted uh, using declassified or, or released documents by the US and some other documents, especially having to do with the counter operation, not just uh, the events that led to the coup that had, uh, at least in Chile, but also having to do with all the uh, coordination activities amongst all other in uh, intelligence uh, agencies um, back then. And I think those would justify an investigation there. I'm not in a position to give a, a final judgment or idea on the accountability by Mr. Kissinger or maybe closer in time uh, Donald Ransfield, who used to be Secretary uh, of the Defense Department under Bush's uh, uh, government in the violation of human rights uh, during those years. We know that Ransfield publicly claimed and advocated practices which are undoubtedly torture, such as waterboarding, trying to have a person suffocate or, 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 or <coughs> choke using water, which is naturally torture. And there are some controversies there. We've conducted different studies and we <coughs> requested that these do not fall into oblivion. Actually, we want to find those perpetrators and hold them accountable for, for those crimes. But for that, we need a court, we need a judge. It's not a truth commission, it's not a, a wise uh, man commission or an academic commission. Actually, we need to have just it, the judges who are willing to conduct <coughs> these uh, investigations. Well, about Donald Ransfield and, and on the topic of Ronald Ransfield and other people from the U.S. administration, in 2003, in Belgium, the universal jurisdiction law was narrowed down, was changed after a claim was lodged against them. And on June 22nd of that year, Ransville said the Belgian judge might investigate as much as they want, but then the NATO headquarters can change as much as they want, as, can be changed as much as, as, as they want as well. And here in Spain, it's been narrowed down to an extent that it's <coughs> vanished. I'm referring once again to the law on universal jurisdiction. Why is that trend now out there? Is it general trend? What can be done in order to reverse this trend? And so universal jurisdiction becomes a value a principle that it's secured and that 
guarantees victims' rights. Well, I think we would also need to uh, recall how President Clinton, in his last days in, in, in office, uh, his last day in office, uh, that was uh, December the 30th, he signed Rome uh, Treaty uh, back in 1999. 1999. This is a. Uh, uh, the Treaty of Rome for the International Court and President Bush deleted, erased the signature. Oh, you know, you know, you know the date by by heart, right? Okay, he erased it, erased Clinton's signature, which I think is unprecedented. Uh, at least in the U.S., I, I don't think there is any similar case. And I don't know about the rest of the world. I don't think. There is any precedent in a democracy that voids or, or overrides international commitments entered into by a previous administration, especially in the field of human rights. I think the worst enemy of universal jurisdiction is politicization. In my opinion, uh, naturally, the U.S. during Bush, the Bush administration had an unilateral behavior. They forgot about the rules uh, about international law at a global level. They opened one's Hanama back then. They promoted boosted torture. They enforced disappearances. And if it weren't for some things discovered by Human Rights Watch, amongst others, where we found those people and we forced them to acknowledge that they had arrested all these people. But in any case, over those years, for the Bush administration, I think they followed the following guideline. Everything goes in the fight against terrorism. That is it. it everything goes. And so, if they were capable of conducting a military intervention as we've had in, in, in Iraq, beyond the discussion and controls in place in the US, and so they could create prisons such as Abu Ghraib or open up Guantanamo, which is a shame even today for the US. I think that they were shameless enough to offend Belgium to that extent. And I do not have the documents, I do not have the information, but probably on Wikileaks we can find something on, on the topic. But uh, yeah, it makes sense, it makes sense. How arrogant US was back then. And, and I think it is a serious mistake. Steps taken, setbacks here in Spain. When actually in Spain has been trying to move forward towards the rule of law, to democracy, which is unquestionable. In a region of the world with which Spain has historical bones. They, they are close. In historical terms, they are very close, these two regions. And somehow they've been carried away by fear. And I hope this can be changed in the future. Thank you very much. It seems that the Spanish Minister of Justice thinks otherwise uh, compared to what you and we say here. We have a question by Mr. Lepoy which I think, uh, well, you can take. He's comparing the principle of passive personality, which according to Spanish law, well, it's not in, non-existing. It's uh, not useful for the prosecution of international crimes committed outside of Spain. But it used to be said that the argument used to justify Prose Pinochet's, uh, Pinochet's prosecution or other cases in Argentina and elsewhere was the fact that we used to say that there were Spanish victims. 
Why do you think this is the case? Do you think it is clear that it's not determining powers or attributions? Or do you think that the reason is that there were Spanish victims? Do you think it was just because we wanted people to understand or why? Well, I think this is a way to showcase the argument before the larger audience well, they might always wonder, what do we have to do? Why should we get involved? Why should we go into litigation over something that happened a few deca decades ago? In a faraway region where we do not have any direct responsibility, there is not territorial link, uh, victims are aliens, they're foreigners, the perpetrator is not Spanish either. So it's even more difficult to justify all those investigations when you think in abstract terms, especially if you do not have the perpetrators here next to you. Still, Pinochet felt he was invincible. And he was showing off in an environment where he was uh, almighty, and he was almighty, even with uh, the years passing. And I think he misled himself, he was mistaken, and we thought the same power relations that he had in his small country, faraway country, where nobody was daring to challenge him, he thought uh, that those relationships could also be reproduced here in Europe. And I think that was the greatest surprise there. I think it is much more difficult to justify it in abstract terms and in investigation, I, I mean, when the dictator is not in Madrid or, or, or at least in front of you. And that's when it might be more difficult to justify those investigations if you show it to the audience, to the public opinion that there is an underlying powerful reason, and that is that Spanish nationals have been direct victims of the regime. But from the principles of, uh, under the principles of universal jurisdiction, that's not necessary. We have a final question. What's the take of Human Rights Watch, your opinion of Human Rights Watch on selective murders? approved by President Obama without legal intervention. I, I guess they are talking about drones. Did you issue any note, any information? We, and I would like to invite you to check out our web page, we have a, well, s several communications on the topic, but specifically we have a report produced by us, and I don't remember when it was, uh, last year sometime around October, it is pretty recent then. This is an on-site report where we work together with uh, Amnesty International and they produce a similar report using the same parameters but in different countries. Some were conducted in Pakistan, some others in Afghanistan, some others in Yemen. I think those are the three places. And so we split, it, we split up the task, or we share the task with uh, Amnesty International to try and identify the landscape, the environment we wanted to see, what, it, what this selective murders were about where the president after lots of thinking at least that's what, what they say that it isn't easy that it has not been easy at all that it's been difficult that you need to put thought to it that you need to have some tools in place control tools i mean or self-restraint tools and of course it has nothing to do with a, a, a legal or a, a judiciary process you don't have due diligence there and based on that, there is a presidential authorization. The removal of some people who might be U.S. nationals, by the way. And so, regardless of concerns and uh, uh, things having to do with due diligence, 
In real terms, there are serious abuses committed and they end up murdering kids, women, relatives, people in the end who are not qualified and no circumstances are qualified under the idea of a legitimate military target, which, by the way, don't think it's so easy. Even if, if impeccable in the operation, maybe in, in fact was not so clear, we could not demonstrate it and actually we have not been uh, refuted by, by the DO D, and they have not produced any reports trying to prove that we are mistaken. They haven't done so. They've stayed silent, silent uh, for both our report and also Amnesty International report. And I think those are very serious uh, abuses. Thank you very much. How's Amy well? And uh, to take Lola's questions as well. well I think it's been explained already, and uh, we all know what Pinochet's case uh, meant, and tomorrow we'll have a chance to to go into further detail. For, for me, it was quite a uh, dramatic change, because once you is issue a arrest warrant, well, actually, I thought it wouldn't be approved. And maybe British people sometimes do things and surprise you. And uh, somehow the first one to be surprised back then was myself. I think it was just a, a few circumstances that happened that right there was the right timing. The, the Roman Institute has been, had been approved. It was the 50th anniversary of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. Jack Straw was there. We, we didn't know the role that Mr. Straw would have on Iraq's war. and. So, uh, this Spanish judge's um, warrant was enforced, and it's also true that we had the enthusiasm of victims. I think Juan is familiar with that time back then. And there was this one person who was persistent, and that was John Dew, key actor for me. He was a minister and counselor for the acting British embassy here in Madrid, and he played such a paramount role in correcting the initial response by the British law enforcement to my initial requests. And about the impact, if I had thought of the impact, well, you know that whenever you issue an arrest warrant, there might be some, some consequences. And if it is uh, against Pinochet, of course, the consequences or the impact uh, could be greater. The thing is, the problem was the, the, the time that they told me they had arrested Pinochet. That's when it dawned on me what a mess we had walked into but it was highly positive in any case. Once again, thanks to the joint efforts of all the victims. It was amazing. The days right after the arrest, there, there was lots of progression made and, and uh, they raced into a conclusion two years later and they made it possible for Jack Straw to approve, to give their permission or authorization to prosecute a number of cases, as Jose Miguel explained. And curiously enough, apart from those of us who were directly involved back then, well, many people don't know this, but the just, Justice Ronald Bart, the British judge, make it, made it possible to have extradition. Extradition, at least back then, at that time, was agreed, it was confirmed, so there was an arrest, and then there was a tradition approved for all cases, over a thousand cases that had been lodged for a torture and disappearance. Then we all know how the story goes, and how Pinochet was a return back to Chile, uh, which was not meaningless because it changed history, actually. 
uh, history for Pinochet. So it is not right when it is said that, well, it, it failed because he wasn't uh, tra tried. Well, he was prosecuted, he uh, was uh, had withdrawal of immunity back in Chile, he was, he ha was under harm arrest until the day he died. And well, he was not convicted, probably because he died before conviction. And because of historical paradoxes, he died on the day of human rights, the day we commemorate human rights in December in 2006, 10th of December, December 2006. And I think he, this was his greatest contribution to human rights. Uh, we are done here. Thank you very much, Jose Miguel. We are now give uh, floor to the panel chaired by Joaquin Gonzalez on the costs of universal jurisdiction. Thank you very much.